Welcome to our talk on Vector Data Lake and do you really need more than a vector database in 2023? So uh, a brief introduction, this is me right up here looking really happy. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. I work on this uh, open source distributed data frame library called uh, Quokka, which is like a cute little Australian marsupial. And uh, you can look at the GitHub link here or follow me on Twitter. And uh, So Stanford must have some magic because uh, usually PhD student and happy doesn't go together. But uh, hi everyone, my name is Chung. Uh, I'm one of the co-creators of the Lance columnar format for multimodal AI. Once upon a time, I was one of the original co-authors of the Pandas library. Uh, you can find me on GitHub or Twitter using the same handle. So in this brief talk, our main assertion is going to be that generative AI is missing a foundational storage layer. And in about 15 minutes, we'll attempt to lay out this argument and show you a little bit of the exploration that we have been doing. If, you've, uh, if you went to the keynote this morning, you saw or heard uh, Eric talk about how there's going to be a Cambrian, a Cambrian uh, explosion of models uh, for different modalities of data, for different tasks, um, and they're getting more capable and cheaper and more efficient uh, all the time. The frameworks like LangChain, Llama Index are also adding lots of integrations and lots of features as well. But when you look at the storage layer, the picture is actually a lot more confusing. So existing vector databases only let you deal with vectors effectively. Traditional databases that sort of just slap on a vector index and call it a day generally have a lot of difficulty scaling. And God forbid you have multimodal data like images or PDFs, 3D point clouds, and there's just no uh, effective storage solution for those types of data. We're super focused on the tip of the iceberg, but in our experience, when serious practitioners are looking to put something into production, they're often uh, faced with the challenge of having to stitch together multiple data stores to manage the vectors, the documents, and also the metadata. They're also running uh, multiple query engines that they need for uh, the flexibility of retrieval methods uh, to experiment across different data sets and use cases. And there's just no good data infrastructure that makes it easy for them to set up that data flywheel for generative AI. All of these challenges actually go far beyond just production serving and crosses solidly into the land of data lakes. Yeah, so the point here is uh, we have seen this picture before, right? We have seen the picture before in structured data where we have an iceberg structure laid out where we have OLTP data stores such as Oracle, CockroachDB, RDS. They're really, really good at handling small volumes of business critical operational data. They support really fast writes, you know, strong consistency levels. You want to select a row at a time to update some customer's balance. That's really quick. But uh, as your data volume grows, it is no longer feasible to store billions and billions of rows in Oracle. So we have ETL tools like Spark to uh, dump the older historical data into data lakes such as Delta Lake or Iceberg. And we have bright, new, shiny lake houses that we build on top of these data lakes to do, you know, fast full table scans, aggregations, cubes, whatsoever, right? And what's really nice about this uh, data lake architecture, which I believe made it really popular, is that it decouples compute and storage. So you can store all your historical data really, really cheaply and only pay for the computation when you're doing it. So if we take a look again at the iceberg of unstructured data, we see that we have pictures, text, images, whatever, voice even. We have open AI or domain specialized models in PyTorch, TensorFlow. We get these embeddings and we are currently storing all of them in vector databases like Pinecone or Elasticsearch or uh, newer alternatives such as LanceDB. So this should kind of remind you of this picture where we are trying to shove everything down, you know, from the top of the tip of the ice, uh, iceberg. Um, so our, our, our observations, right? So TLDR, 
we think that current vector databases are really much like classic OLTP stores. They have really strong focus on high write transactions per second. You can dump thousands, millions of vectors into these databases really quickly and query them immediately after they land. They have very strong consistency guarantees too. They're very good at point updates. They're really fast for uh, point reads. If you are using a generative AI use case, you know you have an embedding you want to look up, Pinecone can do that in 10 milliseconds, and that's great. But what's really not great is that this integrates compute and storage, right? So Pinecone or some other vector databases would keep all of your vector data always live on RAM or SSD to power this really quick point read. So this gets really expensive when you have billions or even trillions of historical vector embeddings that maybe you want to store in the data lake, right? So the problem right now, of course, is that distributed query engines and lakehouse solutions on Data Lake, such as Spark, SQL, or Trino, don't really understand embeddings, but we believe that is a temporary problem. So at this point, you might be asking, what are the OLAP workloads that people might care about, right? Like, are we actually, do we actually care about full table scans on these vectors, right? What are the analog of these SQL, uh, SQL cubes that we've seen in the structured world? Uh, are there these useful workloads that we should think about? Well, one example useful workload could be a recommendation model, right? So companies might have embedding models for their products and their customers, and then every now and then, you know, every week or so, you update your embedding model, and you get new embeddings, and then you suddenly have to do a large batch nearest neighbor search because all of the embeddings of your products have been updated. So you have to recompute what product you should recommend to each customer. And then once you do that, a uh, really large batch nearest neighbor search, you can load the uh, product recommendations into a feature store on Redis or something and just uh, serve it in real time, right? So there are other workloads that I won't go into, like data analytics or machine learning training on embeddings where you train like XGBoost to predict business metrics. But um, some characteristics of these workloads, right? So these typically involve very large batch nearest neighbor search. It's not a single uh, query vector that we have. It's typically because we updated our embedding model, you know, maybe we changed from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. We just updated all our embeddings. We want to recompute everything. And we don't really care too much about latency, right? This is not critical, you know, in the line of business serving, but we do care about cost. We really want to decouple compute and storage here because we don't know when we're doing this operation. We, we want to do this ad hoc, we want to pay on demand, we want to spin up temporary clusters to do this, such as uh, just like Lakehouse architecture would allow you to do unstructured data. And we realized that this is not really the current optimization target for these vector databases, which again really resemble the historical transactional data stores we see for structured data, but it should make you think of Spark or Trino. So here's our proposal of how you should enhance our, these vector databases to uh, do it in the data lake. So we're not advocating that you should replace vector databases, right? They're a critical, uh, very important part of your stack for online transactional workloads. So when you have new data uh, landing, new vector embeddings coming to your generative AI or recommendation application, you should land them in your vector database. And then uh, for historical data, although you should uh, do incremental ETL using Spark or Ray to dump it into the data lake, right? You should store all of your trillions or billions of vectors in the past in solutions such as Delta Lake or Iceberg and use distributed query engines like Spark SQL or Quokka, which is what I'm working on, to query them on demand. And here's an example architecture of how you would do this if you're using Parquet files. Well, you could simply store the vector data as another column in your parquet file, right? Alongside with all your other structured columns, like all your metadata, the parquet, the, the, the vector embeddings is just another binary column. And then when the new embeddings land in your vector database, you can do extract, transform, load, you write new files in your Delta Lake, and you query them on demand. Unfortunately, parquet files don't really support like HNSW or inverted uh, indices that make a nearest neighbor search really fast in vector databases today. So you will have to use GPUs and do exact nearest neighbor search. But uh, you know, as we, people keep talking about in the keynote this morning, GPUs are getting so fast these days that this might not even be a problem. And what's really nice about this paradigm is that once you have landed your vector data into the data lake this way, you can join it easily together with other delta tables that you have, right? You can join it against structured features of your products, for example, if you have product embeddings, and uh, further enhance your recommendation model in this way. 
So here's a simple example of how you would do it in Quokka, which is the library that I'm working on, right? Maybe the distributed data frame library could extend some API that reads uh, par like parquets from an S3 bucket that understands that one of the columns is actually a vector embedding data type, and then it natively supports some operations that you can do on this column, such as a nearest neighbor probe. And then you can also do uh, other kinds of structured operations on top of your data, like structured filtering and structured joins, right? So this is, should really just be an extension to existing distributed query engines and data frame libraries, right? You, sh you shouldn't really need like new tools to do this. We should add it to like Spark SQL or, or Quokka, which is what I'm working on. And some simple like top of the line envelope calculations of how much this will cost. If you're doing a nearest neighbor search on 100 million, 100 dimensional vectors, if you have 100 probe vectors, this is only going to cost you 10 cents to do this batch nearest neighbor search this way. And this is doing exact nearest neighbor search on GPUs. And if you have 100,000 probes, right, if you're a big company, you have 100,000 customers, and you're doing a batch nearest neighbor search on 100 million products, it's only cost you $10. And what's really killer feature about this is the storage cost of 100 million vectors in this way is $1 a month on S3. And if you want to keep them always live on Pinecone, for example, this would be like $300, which we estimate. So <clears throat> if, you were, um, if you were attending the Snowflake Summit, as you fly into LAX, you would see in an ad that would tell you that Snowflakes is nine times the cost of uh, Databricks. And so all of you guys coming here, you'll see Pinecone is 320 times the cost of S3. And of course, remember what Tony is presenting is on 100 dimensional vectors. Typically in generative AI, you'd be looking at 768 or 1536 dimensional vectors. So that difference in cost is actually even more exaggerated in practice. Now, certainly we can do this in Parquet. I think it's a fine choice. Um, I do think that if we can avoid the complexity of running these OLAP workloads on GPUs, uh, we should try to do that, uh, make it a little bit less costly per query. Um, and also remember the ETL work that we had to do here. Uh, if we can avoid that, that would also be great. And so this is why we're excited to be working on uh, integrating Lance into Quokka. Lance is a new open source columnar format for AI. The goal of Lance is to unify data storage for multimodal AI across all of the different modalities. And uh, by reducing the need for making multiple copies of the data for different purposes, we can greatly reduce the TCO of your data lake. Out of the box, Lance is compatible with all of your favorite tools, from Pandas to Polars to DuckDB, Spark, PyTorch, the list goes on. We're really optimized for storing unstructured data, so images, PDFs, point clouds, audio, uh, and so on. Uh, Lance is laid out a little bit differently, and that allows us to achieve multiple orders of magnitude faster performance than Parquet when it comes to random access. This is really important for AI uh, debugging, for shuffling, data loading, and also it makes it worth it to add uh, rich index uh, indices. Uh, so we've added vector index, a full text search index, and we're working on more regular database indices. And one thing that I haven't mentioned here is that uh, versioning comes free with Lance. So if you're updating your uh, vectors on a daily basis or an hourly basis, and if you make a mistake, you can actually always time travel and roll back to the last successful state and make it really easy for ML engineers to debug their workloads in production. Now, uh, we don't have time to go into all of the details, so I'll just highlight sort of one difference. Um, Parquet is laid out in a way where the offsets and the data is linked, interleaved with each other. And so that means you have to read the entire row group to access one data point. Turns out, if you're storing large blobs, like images, for example, that actually makes a huge difference in performance. Instead, with Lance, uh, we've actually separated the offsets w from the data, so we can know exactly the, uh, what byte range we need to read to get one image or one uh, audio sample, for example. This is one of the primary um, factors that gives us much better random access performance, which in turn gives us really great indexing performance. So the integration in Akoka is going to look almost identical to the integration with Parquet, so that you don't actually have to think about how your data is actually stored on, on disk or in S3. But Quokka will know if there is an index available, and if so, can push down the nearest neighbor query to the Lance index. 
Okay, so obviously Tony and I um, can talk for hours on this subject, but we only have a few minutes left. So I want to leave you with a couple of uh, take-home messages. One is, uh, as you've seen, there's actually a number of really valuable large-scale vector workloads in the data lake. And vector databases today are just not a good fit for those. Parquet definitely can work uh, with the right pipelines and the right setup with GPUs, but overall it still feels a little bit suboptimal. So what we're going to be excited uh, to be doing over the next uh, couple of weeks is uh, using Lance for Coca instead of Parquet. We think Lance is a much better format. Uh, it reduces the need for ETL. You can run it cheaply on AWS Lambda. Uh, it supports automatic versioning. And so the only thing missing in Lance right now is a large batch query mode. So once we add that, we'll be finishing uh, the integration to Coca and then rerunning the benchmarks. And uh, we'll publish those numbers once we have them. All right, thank you so much.